Welcome to Veteran Voices, a podcast dedicated to giving a voice to those that have served in our country's armed forces. On this series, which is part of the Supply Chain Now family of programming, we sit down with a wide variety of veterans and veteran advocates to gain their insights, perspective, and experiences. We'll talk with many individuals about their challenging transition from active duty to the private sector, and we'll discuss some of the most vital issues facing veterans today. Join us for this episode of Veteran Voices. Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton with Veteran Voices. Welcome to today's show. So on today's show, we're going to be talking with a veteran, a business leader, a serial entrepreneur, you name it, that's doing big things in the talent acquisition space. So stay tuned for a great show. In the meantime, here's a quick programming note. This program is part of the Supply Chain Now family of programming. Find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. All you got to do is search for Veteran Voices and subscribe so you don't miss a thing like this this great conversation we're going to have today with one Vince Wainwright, founder at Scale Executive Search. Vince, how you doing? Well, Scott, thanks so much for having me. How are you today? Hey, doing fantastic. We were talking earlier about just how much uh, of a rewarding experience this this series has been, you know, meeting and learning the stories of my fellow veterans. And I think we've got a home run conversation with you teed up. So I'm looking forward, appreciate your time and looking forward to your perspective. Thank you. All right. So Vince, for starters, we're going to get to know each other a little better. We're going to get to know you a lot better. So tell us, where, you know, where'd you grow up? And you got to give us an anecdote or two about your upbringing. So a born in Long Beach, born and raised in Redondo, like I like, I like to say, uh, two amazing parents. Uh, they married for 25 years. Actually, uh, we were divorced for 10 years and got remarried in Vegas, which I got to go to that wedding a few years ago. Just uh, always had the entrepreneurial drive. We lived in Oregon for four years. During that four years, I ended up starting my own bike shop. So we turned my backyard into a bike store where I had the local kids come in. We were tuning up their bikes. Now, not charging. I mean, you, you trade like cards and whatnot. I don't think I ever co- recovered any money, but just a lot of, I always wanted to have my, not necessarily get my hands in, but always wanted to have a way to, to bring people in, teach people new things, and also learn about whatever craft I'm interested in, whether that's sports, putting bikes together, and now business. <laughs> so what part of Oregon? Grants Pass, Oregon. Okay. Is that? I don't think anybody's heard of it. Just, uh, you know, it's a little town. My grandma lived there. You know, because uh, I'm third generation Italian. So the Italians came over in Pennsylvania. Grandma was one of the first females to go to Penn State. For whatever reason, she settled in Grants Pass, Oregon. She called my parents during the riots and said, look, you guys got to get out of there. I mean, we were, we were living in Palos Verde, which is a very safe place in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. My dad pretty much looked at my mom and said, look, you got to get the kids out of here because from, from our house, you could see the fires. We wow. Up on the hill. So we packed up, made the 12 hour drive in a little Mitsubishi. And I had the time of my life living there building tree forts, you know, BMXing and all that good stuff. <laughs> hey, it sounds like an outstanding childhood. It really and I've, was. But I've heard a lot about Oregon. I've been out there once. I, I went out to a, a manufacturer that relied on a lot of the potatoes and other vegetables that uh, farming was real big in Oregon at the time. It probably still is, I imagine. Huge. All right. So now that you've painted a, a really neat visual of your uh, of some of your childhood experiences, let's talk about what made you join the military. Oh, so you know that that's an interesting one because you know, I was a kid. Uh, you know, a lot of kids growing up, they used to get three checks on the board. So if you're misbehaving, one check, they get three. My dad got sick of being called every day at around one o'clock. So he said, Vince, he sat me on the teacher and said, "You're getting two checks." So what I'm getting at is, you know, unfortunately, I didn't have the, the academic strength or the academic backbone. I didn't have the, the fortitude and the wherewithal to sit down and hunker down the books. Now I do. I'm just about to finish up my degree, and then I'll apply at SC for my master's, and I think there's a strong chance that I'll get in. Wow. But I ended up learning how to learn. So to get back to your question, my dad used to take me to, you know, the uh, – like the Air Force cadets when I was a teenager. And I remember going out there and getting screamed at. And mind you, I'm a football player. I've been playing football since I could walk, right? So coach screaming at me, I love that stuff. It jacks me <laughs> up. But there's something about standing in line with these, you know, 14 other kids that I don't know. 
I remember them not being necessarily in shape or necessarily um, very, let's say, confident, if you will. I just remember thinking, nah, this, this isn't for me. But then as, you know, when you get into high school and your friends are going to SC, Johns Hopkins, and I'm kind of looking around and I'm thinking, man, I feel like I have so much to offer, but me and my 2.5 GPA, I'm going to have to go to a JC. You know, I was a quarterback, but I wasn't a very talented quarterback. Am I going to play quarterback at a JC? So the pieces started coming together. It's one, you know, I, I always want to be a provider and I always want to take care of myself. I don't ever want to ask my parents for anything. So I ended up having to take my recruiter that found me at the gym in my high school. He drove me home. My parents said, you know, who's this guy in this uniform? We pretty much sat him down. I was only 17 at the time, so they had to sign the papers. And I said, look, you know, I'm not strong academically. I saw what happened with 9-11. I don't really understand the different branches of the military. I mean, I didn't even know there was enlisted in officers. Right. I'm completely naive. I just wanted to go be surrounded by guys that cared about themselves, cared about their country, and wanted to be in shape. Those, those were my three things. But looking back, a little embarrassing. I should have definitely had some more academic endeavors in that. But that's that's where I was at the time. Looking back, as they always say, hindsight is twenty twenty. I, I would argue that hindsight is more like twenty ten. We don't know everything at the time, right? And and we don't know what we don't know. So clearly now you're tackling academically. It sounds like you're you're wrapping up your undergrad and looking at getting your uh, master's at, at USC, huh? Yeah. You know, it's got and not I don't want to get off track too much, but the stuff that's out there for vets, because if you're, again, not to throw myself under the bus, but I, I really want to be an example because I'm certainly a success case. I mean, you met my sister. My sister and I, uh, you, were, you know, we're not going to impress you with the SAT, but we are <laughs> going to impress you with, you know, being personable, being honest, and just working our faces off. So yes. what I want to hone in on is these vets that get out and they make a mistake, which I did, and go to a university at Phoenix, a national university. No grind with those two universities, but we have so much more to offer. And I know that from sitting in class and seeing the different demographics and being in the military, you meet so many different walks of life that we don't have to. You, I mean, you can get out of enlisted and go straight to Yale. I just right. did a two week boot camp in Notre Dame with, uh, I was supposed to be back at MD on the anniversary of burying my grandfather two years ago, but with COVID, I didn't get to do it. So there's a, I was with the Warrior Scholar Project and they send these kids, they send me. To, to Yale or Notre Dame or MIT. I mean, there's wow. so many options out there for us, but we but we just have to have the wherewithal have to be able to to take the deep breath, and much like when we deal with the VA, to to find out those avenues of where we can get the best help. Yeah, well put. Okay, so Vince, uh, and you referenced your sister, so we should say give a shout out to Natalie. Wayne oh, Wright, yeah. who's doing big things in real estate in the Vegas market, I believe. So hello, Natalie. Thanks hey, for y'all. connecting us uh, with, <laughs> with Vince. All right. So you talked about why you joined the military. Let's talk more about your military career. So tell us about the basics, the branch, your role, and what your official MOS or occupation was. Okay. So that's another fun story is, you know, I had to have my parents sign me up, went through my whole senior year, which again was another great feeling because then your teachers had you but hey, hey, Vince, I heard you're going into the uh, the military. That's the, and but of course, my my football coaches knowing that I was going to the Navy, I didn't even know about that YMCA song. So they're singing in the Navy. <laughs> you know, what the heck are you guys talking about? So anyway, once I saw the video, I thought, all right, I'm gonna get you guys back. Uh, <laughs> so it was, you know, it was interesting going into into the Navy because you go to the recruiting site and see the Marines and the Air Force, and then you have the the Navy. So I went into the Navy September 30th, of 2002. Spent my October 2nd birthday in the military, in boot camp, you know, it's 30 degrees out in Chicago. Um, and then based on what you do is you go from there to your A school, it's where you learn about your rate. And I chose to be an operations specialist. And for anyone that doesn't know, which most people are not going to know what an operations specialist is, I'm doing a tactical communication. So when we're in the, when we're in the Gulf, I'm making sure I'm putting the pirates in these little bays on my radar screen in CIC, which is the Combat Information Center, and reporting those contacts to either the tactical action officer or the, the, C, the CO, the captain of the ship. So that's fascinating. I think we've all seen movies. As folks know, I was in Air Force. Uh, right. I was a lowly data analyst in Air Force. But we've all seen these movies from Top Gun to plenty of others where you see the, the, the CNC and you see the operators tracking different things on, on the, yeah. um, you know, that big radar screen and, and moving me. stuff around. That was you. Yeah. Man, that is a, that, that's a perfect visual. And I bet 
I can only imagine how intense and how much pressure at certain times and, and how challenging that role can be because because of the nature of how critical that role is to you know, the vessels and fleets, right? Right. We, we had a blast. And you know, like I've already said, I was ADD. So if you can imagine, you know, my captain, the Rear Admiral Jesse Wilson, he's now retired. Uh, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I also threw a show. Uh, House of Blues just opened. I planned an entire music event while I was on deployment. And that gentleman, Jesse Wilson, Rear Admiral Jesse Wilson, went to my show with his wife. Now, did he go because I was uh, a little outlandish and he was wondering, you know, is this guy going to leave a bad name on my shirt? <laughs> Hopefully, you know, because that would be the responsible thing to do. But I'm telling you, he showed up. He was the quintessential, just buttoned up, the most amazing. I, I think about the guy every day. I think about him and Master Chief Magneta and O.S. Simons, who now, is now an officer. I just had this, this amazing nucleus of leaders that, took a person like me that was kind of very, very much scattered and enabled me to sit and in CIC, create that, that tactical environment, feed that good information to the captain and to my, uh, my superiors. Love it. We talked a little bit about what you did, being an ops specialist, you know, tactical communications. We, we, we painted a great visual. And you've mentioned some of the folks that both you worked for and it sounds like you worked with that really right. made an impact. Let's talk a little bit more about that because I don't know about you, but in my experience, the people I were as, as proud and, and as much as you enjoy serving your country, your right. colleagues in uniform, really, I mean, that is is some of the secret sauce in life. So tell us more about some of these special people you worked with and worked for. Oh boy. So again, Rear Admiral Wilson, just, just a gift of a human being. You know, when you're going on deployments, we, we had two C COOs fired. You know, one was having relationships with someone on board. You, when you are one person on a 350 person ship, you get to see every single walk of life. My birthing, for instance, where I slept, I had a, a top rack. You have know, racks are three racks deep. So I chose the top rack because you had a little more um, until you had to touch the, the bulkhead there. The a little ceiling, more head, right? head room, right? Yeah, yeah. It was, this was the bottom of my rack to right here was how much room we had. Because I remember, this, and I was so comfortable sleeping because the boat would rock you to sleep. But I just remember thinking, I'm so, I was a young kid. And I just, I, when I got out and I was going to have kids, how am I going to tell them that my my rack was this small? I mean, how can anybody understand it? Because you can't. And, and two, right? So to our listeners that, that aren't seeing your arm signal there, that is, uh, what, about a two feet of space, you'd say, maybe two and a half feet? Yeah. So say, like a, that. Size, say a size 16 shoe is about how much room you have. <laughs> okay. that's, that's probably very accurate. I love that. All right. So, so Vince, keep, keep driving. I, I love the, again, it's, for me, it's about visuals. And, and a lot of folks may not know, a lot of veterans may not know. I mean, I, I told you pre-show how little I knew about the Navy. They might not just connect two and two and, and understand they're squeezing a bunch of sailors into a very confined and limited space. And so trying to accommodate for everybody's personal space and their sleeping space, I mean, it is really tight quarters, right? It is really tight. And, you know, in my birthing, birthing, and think of birthing as like your, your campsite for a different area. And it, let's say if you guys, if you're going camping, right, you have, uh, you're going to have certain demographics and certain people that are responsible for different parts of the ship or the campsite sleep in certain areas, which makes right. sense. So the people that we slept with were called boatsman mates. Now, boatsman mates are the roughest, toughest guys that you can imagine <laughs> in the military. I mean, these guys, they will give you the shirt off their back, of course. But if for some reason there's some there's some type of disrespect going on or you're not listening when you have to be listening, a boatsman mate will literally backhand you. I mean, it's not even a it's not a it's not a figure of speech. You will get backhanded. Uh, they will throw you into a, a rack and just pummel the heck out of you. Because what they are is they're, they're incredibly important to the ship. I mean, these guys, they're not only the guys that are painting the ship, right? Which sounds kind of uh, not as severe. But when you're painting the ship at 150 degree weather, you're going to get a little peed off if something's not going right. And then also when kilos are landing, when the helicopters are landing on, those are the boats mates that are up pretty much 24 hours a day, six days a week, landing the helicopters, guiding them in, shooting them off taking all of the ammo on board, taking the, the food on board. I mean, they're involved in anything. So what I'm getting at is one of my best friends who actually get to go visit in a couple of weeks. We're going to do a 10-mile ruck, uh, ruck walk in, um, in Chicago. He's part of the DFW there. He's a cop. I mean, just, you know, rough, amazing dude. 
when you know roughly has to be amazingly 24 hours a day. So I met him in the birthing, and you know it's two different walks of life. And you got a person that gets to be in an air conditioned space, CIC, the Combat Information Center, and then you got a guy that's you know hanging over the side, 120 degrees in the Gulf, or and he was also a rib driver, which is a rigid hull inflatable boat. And these are the guys that jump off of our ship into this little boat with like a 50 cal on front. So you're talking, you know, five inch bullets and going to these pirate ships and they're arresting pirates, bringing them on board. And the friend that I get to visit named Brazel, he was the actual driver or the, the helmsman of that little boat. So the fact that I get to go see my pal in a couple of weeks just lights my life up. And I met him on board USS Higgins. You're, you're reading my mind because where I was going next is what type of ship did you serve on? What's the name of it? A USS Higgins. So it was two ships. I did the USS John Paul Jones, which they had just gotten back from deployment. They were the key ship in the Gulf during September 11th. I was not a part of that, unfortunately. I would have loved to have been. They got back, and then I uh, assumed that post in, what was it, two, late 2000? And then for, on 2002, we did what was called the Sea Swap. And they took, which is ridiculous. I don't know how they did this, and they pulled it off. They took 300 men and a couple women because that we USS Higgins was actually the first ship to be co-ed. So they had two women on these planes and they flew us from LAX, excuse me, from San Diego out to Dubai, which is in the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. So they flew us up and we did a sea swap. So that whole chain of command from USS Higgins flew over and took over John Paul Jones. And then we flew from John Paul Jones and we took over the USS Higgins in the Gulf. So it was gotcha. incredibly strenuous, but like, what an outstanding experience. I didn't know the, uh, about that note about the USS Higgins being the first co-ed vessel. You mentioned the sea swaps, and you also mentioned pre-show about some of your deployments. Talk about some of your deployments while you served. Incredible. I, I got to do three of them in five years, which I extended. So you, typically you do a four-year to four-year term, right, or four-year tour in the military. I extended for one year because, and you know this too, is your chain of command is everything. I mean, you either wake up and you're pumped up and you, you go out to PT in the morning, which is PT is physical training, which I led on my ship along with the, or as the enlisted member with the officers. And then you can go and you can be totally bummed out. So those first two deployments were not my favorite, right? But then I finally had this amazing chain of command with a, a Master Chief Magneta, who is now works for USAA. And I can't, I'm, I'm jealous of them that they get to work with this individual because the guy <laughs> is phenomenal. I mean, he is a quintessential... Navy, Master Chief, was all around good guy. So anyway, I had him as my leader. So I said, I'm going to, I'm, I'm extended for you. I'm going to go on this third deployment. So, you know, I've been, I've, I only did West Pass, so three West Pass. So what that means is West Pacific. So a lot of time in the Gulf, foreign of Africa, we got to go to Fiji, we did Canada, Australia, UAE, Bahrain, of course, uh, Goa, India. I'm jealous. Oh, yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, where'd you get to go? Well, I just had one small 45-day uh, TDY to okay. Al Jabbar Air Base in Kuwait. Okay, now, that's interesting. It, it for me that grew up in in small town South Carolina, it was it was an eye opener. I really enjoyed it. And yeah. a special thing for me, Vince, uh, when we were when I was there, this was October. This was late September, October, and early November, two thousand and one. Right, and you were referencing some of the some of the things that were taking place in that time. When I was there, we started the air campaign again uh, in Afghanistan, and of course, that time the American community, for me at least, we wanted retribution for what took place right in New York, and and there was so much energy. I'll never forget it to the day I die. The energy as the planes were taken off. Um, I'm not sure what time it was, 11, 12 at night, and and you could see it, and everyone knew what was taking place, and the amount. Yeah of emotion was so palpable and uh i mean the skins the the hair on the back of my neck standing up right this second Me too. you know and that, that was a long time ago and you know no one likes to be vengeful but that was such a kick in the gut as we all know um and so it, it was a proud moment to serve and it really was one of the highlights of of my tenure so but vince let's that's a great story scott I gotta well that's an amazing story you're very, right there in the thick of it very okay. real at the time. Um, yeah. So I want to talk about some of the, I mean, the five, five years and, and all the deployments, three deployments, but all the places you went right. and, and be, 
serving in such a critical role in the Navy, when you look back at some of your accomplishments, what are those that you're, you're going to be telling your family about and your friends about until the day you die? Oh, man, there's, there's so many so many different in- instances. Um, you know, my, my six-year-old, it, he wants to be a Navy SEAL, which I promise you it has nothing to do with me. Uh, of course, I, I am uh, somewhat militant. My wife accuses me of, of, of uh, all the time because it's, you know, it's, it, when you wake up in the morning, you, it, not necessarily he's six. I'm not making him make his bed, but you know, do those push-ups and sit-ups. Tell me what you're thankful for. Let's get, just get a good cycle going. So you know, it, it varies so much. And what he asked me a couple of days ago is, "Hey, Dad, because Veterans Park is right down the road for me in Redondo Beach because my office is Redondo Beach, my house is Redondo Beach, uh, less than a mile away." Keep everything really close, which I which I learned from the military because right. things go haywire, right? You have to keep uh, your family, your friends, and uh, even your dry cleaner everything nice and close. That way, everything's ready for you so you can perform, right? So he was asking me at Veterans Park. He was saying, "Hey, Dad, how come you didn't die in the military?" And I thought, "Man, what a what a great question." I said, "You know, we of course, we don't all die, huds, and if if I did die, then I would have been grateful to die. But I'm so glad that I didn't die because now I have you here." So to answer your question, those those things, you know, really just being a connector because, you know, I'm not a Navy SEAL. I'm, uh, I'm not the guy that wants to make fun of the guy that's in the Marines or the Air Force. I never had any of that. So I, I love camaraderie. I guess just really being a connector, being the guy that's kind of like, I've always been the guy that's kind of on the fringes. Like I'm not diehard life or Navy guy. But then again, of course, I, I would never want to bad mouth the Navy. So to answer sure. your question, Kind of being, I love, and that's also why I think I'm an executive recruiter, because I love to be that middleman that when a CEO or a hiring manager comes to me and says, hey, look, we can't find the son of a gun. How are you going to find him? And I, I don't know how, or I do know how I do it, <laughs> but I can do it in record time. And the reason is, is that I understand, I, for whatever reason, I'm, on the, I'm able to understand people's needs, whether you're in the military or in the civilian sector, and mesh the two with the other appreciating body. So you're the ideal client or the ideal, um, when you're in CIC and things are going haywire, which they do. I'm able, I was always the guy that was able to kind of calm things and make people laugh at a lot of my own expense, of course, which that's, that's a gift. <laughs> I picked that up. And, you know, those are, blessed are those people. I mean, there is part peacemaker, it's part connector, as you were saying. Right. It's part, you know, facilitation. It's part keeping things calm even in the in the craziest of times i mean the people that with your skill sets are such a huge resource uh, in the military and in the in the private sector for that matter so i can i can see you in that role i i can really see you be part of the glue pulling that ship crew together all right so now vince we want to talk about your transition and get and hear your story there as well as pick your brain on what maybe some uh, any currently active duty service members that may be listening to this that are picking up tips or folks that have already transitioned and maybe they're they're trying to find new resources or new way of, of looking at things. So let's talk about your transition. You transitioned in 2005. Is that right? 2007. Seven. I'm sorry. So from, yeah. From two, I'm sorry. I, I, you know what? I gave you the wrong date too. I think I told you 2000. So 2002 to 2007. Gotcha. Okay. So that was most folks might understand that that in 2007, you know, 13 years ago, there wasn't nearly as many resources as there are now. And what I would argue, just my opinion, Vince, is that while now there's been a lot more emphasis around hiring not only veterans, but also their spouses, because right. spouses need to succeed too. That's you know, right. 13 years ago, that wasn't nearly as front and center. So Vince, tell us your transition story. Uh, well, so what I did is I got, I flew out of the Gulf. Uh, it's another interesting story. Uh, so USS Higgins, I, I had 45 days of leave on the book. We were in Saudi Arabia and it was my time to go. And I, so I said, all right guys, so how am I going to get home? And there was crickets. So I went to the <laughs> YN, the YN is a yeoman. So they're the admin. That's like me going to HR, exactly what it is. It's like you and HR and going, Hey, it's my last day. Um, I don't have a car because you guys bust me in. Can I get a taxi back? And then HR looking at you like, no, you can either walk home or figure out your flight. So I said, all right, I got you military. Thank you. So what I did is I just took myself to the Air Force Base. I said, uh, here's my orders, you know, because orders are how you get from spot to spot. And I said, I'm on USS Higgins. You can build a ship, uh, fly me home. So they, they flew me home, a uh, 12-hour flight on an Air Force flight, which they had just have the uh, shallow depths. So there's no seats. Right. 
I was laying on a deck with a, a blanket on me because it is cold up there. I mean, it's like they open up a window and it's like <laughs> negative 30. But I'm thinking, I'm going home. And I like already had a job. Sorry. <laughs> that was like Space A, right? Is that space what they call it? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the ship was not happy because – uh, for some reason, the ship got charged for me to take that flight, which my, my master chief told me. He's like, Vin, how the hell did you do that, man? I was like, well, what you guys expect me to do? I'm not trying to vacation in Saudi Arabia. Get me out of here. So anyway, took a, took a flight home on the, on the uh, ship dime. Uh, got home. I didn't even take any leave. I just went straight into this position as a, uh, as a what was I, as a communications engineer for a fantastic company called Captain C-A-C-I. Those guys are incredible. Uh, they gave me an amazing salary, which I, I uh, negotiated my way up. So I was, uh, what was I, like 22 years old, making 70 grand, just wow. got paid out a bunch of leave, living in San Diego. My friends are looking at me like, because they're all college grads, how the hell do you do this, man? <laughs> you know, I got the, the nice clothes to wear every day because I always knew that I wanted to be a professional. I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. But then when somebody comes to you and says, hey, we're going to pay you, you know, they offered me 68. I think I've talked them up to 72. Nice, Vince. Yeah, yeah. I I was lucky and I was uh, a little audacious, right? But I knew that what I had to offer. So what I did is I I was a communications engineer and they flew me to Japan. Because what the military does, we take our old communication equipment that is still state of the art and we, we sell it to other countries. So I pretty much went out there and all I could do was stand like this really with my hands lock and just go like this and watch them press buttons because I wasn't allowed to say a word. I just had to be a U.S. presence there. So that that's what I did for the first few years. So while you were active duty, did your commander allow you to, you know, put irons in the fire and, and interview and, and, and job search? I mean, it, it, I know on one hand, it's got to be really challenging to exit and start a new position in, in the civilian side from day one. But on the, on the flip side, a lot of stories I hear about folks, really the transition takes, you know, they wish they would have that. How'd you really hit the ground running, so to speak? You know, it, it's, it's just, it's a gift of having good friends. My buddy, Adam Digg, who is an IT man. So, it, uh, you know, anybody knows what an IT man is. Uh, in charge of the computers and the ship. He had a phenomenal job with Kathy. And he said, hey, just make me a resume. These guys will hire you because, you know, he was another personable guy. So number one, being personable. And then number two, if you don't, may I share another quick story, Scott, about? Yeah, please. So this is, this is what it boils down to. And I want all, every military, every military person to hear this is, you know, NCIC, Combat Information Center, we had, or on the ship, we would have what was called General Quarters, GQ. And that's when we think someone's going to bomb us, shoot us, or we're being threatened. And there was weeks where you had General Quarters going, man, every 10 minutes for like days, and you, you, would, you would see red because you were so upset. You just wanted to throw a bomb in the ocean so this would all stop, right? Uh, this is what I've noticed because I've gotten out. I've watched everybody, and I'm on LinkedIn every day, and I, I get to talk to all my old Navy buddies. I got up every time I heard GQ. And even you know after it goes off the 300th time, literally, there was guys that would lay in their rack because, hey, it's GQ again. I'm not getting up. Right. My answer for anybody that wants to be successful in the military, if you weren't the guy that was was not getting up every time because you just figured you were too tired, then you know, you're gonna have a rough time in the civilian sector because there's always gonna be alarms going off in the civilian sector. They're not gonna be as loud. They're gonna be, hey, it's gonna be a quick email from HR. Hey, did you send us that document yesterday? And I'm telling you, you will get fired if you don't send HR the right document within a couple of days because HR can lose their job. So a long story short. If you're not going to show up every day with the uniform on, ready to push the button or fire the gun, you're not going to make it in the civilian world. So whatever it is that you're going to do, you have to show up. You have to throw that fake smile on your face or just be professional. And you have to take the orders because no matter what, there's always somebody that's going to be giving you orders, even if you own your own company. That's right. And that would be the customer always, right? That's right. Um, So Vince, let's, one of the other things I heard there is the power of building, growing, and maintaining a network, right? Right. Uh, It's such an old adage and probably a lot of folks are tired of hearing it. And it's not necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily accurate, the old adage of it's not what you know, it's who you know. But there are times when that is very, very accurate. So talk for a second, if you would, about the power of networking. Uh, I'd be honored to, Scott. Thank you. This is, I mean, this is something that I drive home to people every day. 
I need you to understand, even though I'm dealing with executives, which I, I have two companies, one is you know 120K and below, which is not necessarily executive positions, and then 120K above, which is you know the, the senior managers, directors, COOs, CEOs, and I'm hired that whole team, the whole C-suite. Uh, I, there's at least, even during COVID, there's one person a week that is on the phone crying. It could be a man or a woman mm. um, that, you know, the men, you can feel them hiding it because it, they feel like they're the head of the household, which obviously have changed now. Uh, what your network is, is just so important because at the end of the day, whether it's me uh, last year coaching my son's team and a woman calling me from SpaceX saying, look, I don't know what's going on. And I, I think the world of her, uh, she, she, the astronauts called her while she was taking a walk on the beach. And, you know, she was worried. And wow. she didn't know where she was going to go from SpaceX. And here's the advice that I give her and that I give every, if somebody, whether you're down in the dumps or you're riding high and you know that someone else, it's another company is going to pick you up like that. And that is you must go on LinkedIn. You must find somebody that's doing what you want to do or what you are currently doing. And you must email them or call them or reach out to them. Now, are you going to email them and say, hey, I want to pick your brain? Never say pick your brain because if somebody's successful, they've got a million people that want to pick their brain. And I can tell you, it makes me feel bad because I have a hundred plus emails in my LinkedIn and I, I want to help every single one of these people, but I can't. So get specific. So here it is, right? Let's, let's use myself for an example. I'm an executive recruiter. I want to be a better recruiter. What do I do? And I do this. I study the guys at a company called Corn Ferry. Corn Ferry is the elite executive recruiters. These guys, from the documents they present in the presentation. So what you do is you go on LinkedIn, you find that person's profile, whether you want to be a mechanical engineer or whatever it is. If, you're, if your son's in college right now, he says, hey, dad, I want to be a mechanical engineer. You say, come here, son. And if you're a vet, you have the free premium LinkedIn that they give you for one year. And you sit him down and go, hey, we're going to search all the mechanical engineers. You populate mechanical engineer and your zip code within 25 miles, you're going to see a thousand of those people. You're going to know one of them. And if you don't, your friend's going to know one of them. You're going to reach out to them. You have coffee, you have lunch, you get a five minute phone call, you Zoom with them and you put the pieces together. What that does, and it's, it's much like reading books, right? Is your brain creates these webs. Your network creates these webs. And A goes to B goes to C and you start to anger mingle. You learn what the best colleges are that for the mechanical engineer. You learn who the companies are that's hiring mechanical engineers, who's traditionally hires them. You learn about all the different facets of that. So find that person. You don't have to use the word mentor, but find who you want to be or where you want to be because they're on LinkedIn and just hound them with nice messages. Send them a $5 Starbucks e-card. Let them know, hey, <laughs> you know, I know we can't have coffee, but let's have that call. Here's a coffee for you to buy before the call because I've got a lot of great questions to ask you. Now, I, I love that advice around doing your homework and finding what you want to do and then finding a bunch of folks that do it and then right. studying you know from the best and you you mentioned corn ferry benchmarking companies really right. identifying how they do it why they do it and there's always ways you can improve but taking it back to um transition clearly doing your homework and i love that phrase you mentioned hey, you got to 86 that phrase pick your brain because everybody says it and it's so vague but getting really specific i heard you say vince on right. on what it is that you want to learn in that five minute ten minute whatever time they'll give you you know that really helps folks decide which emails and phone calls to answer versus the ones that they may not right that's it scott you got it there is a load of great advice in the last 10 minutes that you shared there. And, and I really appreciate you taking time to do it. What else from your transition experience gave you a lesson learned that you can share along those lines with, with our listeners? What else, how else would you advise listeners about their potential or their current transition? Find those mentors, let your network know. Now, so don't, don't go on Facebook and say that, you know, to, this, the, there's this thing where people go on, which I took myself off Facebook about a month ago. It's been terrific. You don't have to declare what you're going to do. You don't, you don't, what do they call those guys now? Or uh, support buddy or accountability buddy. Mm. Look, look, you can do that, but it has to come from within you. I promise you, you're going to fail. I promise you, you're going to cry yourself to work. I promise you, you're not going to get the job that you want the first time, maybe even the 15th time. Number one, be willing to fail. Number two, if you're transitioning from the military, there's nothing that's going to be as hard 
as being in the military, period. So understand that, put that behind you. Don't carry that on your back. You know, you're no longer wearing the boots. You take all the uh, civilians or this, or this has to be that way. That's not the way the real world works. The real world is a hodgepodge of crap and you're either going to swim with it or it's just gonna end up slapping you in the face. If you're a civilian and you are making the transition, you have to keep your head up. You have to surround yourself with people that you care about and people that care about you. Now, look, if you look around the people that you care about and care about you are not necessarily the best crowd, you have to have the goal, the, when I'm saying the goal, the, the, the guts to find those new people. Please don't start joining groups on LinkedIn and Facebook to appease that. You need face-to-face -face or um, on the phone with those people. You can spend, as the, I've already spent thousands on the different courses. I'm telling you right now, it's the human, the guts that it takes the human for that one-to-one -one interaction. Even if that is going to a bar or a wine bar and starting a conversation, that, the, there's fantastic things to be learned from there. But please make the, 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 have the wherewithal and the guts to do the reach out, to sit on the LinkedIn and find those people. And I, here's another thing too, Scott, is I've, I've offered that to thousands of people, literally thousands, uh, that I'll help them and I'll find those people and they won't do it. So the thing is, and the reason why uh, such a small percent of the world is successful is that they're the people that just take that first step. So right. allow yourself, and I wish I could give you the strength, take the strength from me to, to take that first step and reach out to somebody that intimidates you and ask them, hey, I'm on your track. I've already taken the first step. I've, I've read this certificate, whatever it is, however you can relate to that and see what they have to say. What do you think about that, Scott? I love it. In fact, I got out in 02, and I struggled in my transition. But, you know, you, you, you kind of find your way, and then and then you just work hard and, and meet people and, and always constantly learn. But unfortunately, I'd like to echo one of your points you made, Vince. It, what I've observed over the last 18 years is there's a lot of folks that will sit back, sit on the sidelines, wait for things to come to them because they don't want to do what you suggested they do, which is take that first step and That's be right. willing. You're not going to, especially I think back when I got out, there's lots of plenty I didn't know. There's still plenty today. I don't know, Vince, but back then I couldn't talk to talk because you know, I, I wasn't in, it had no manufacturing experience. I had no supply chain experience. You, you had to accumulate that. But the only way you accumulate that knowledge is you, you jump in that, as you put it, the hodgepodge of crap that just yeah. is work and That's right. industry, right? That's right. I, so Vince, this is this is I think really practical expertise you're sharing, and I really appreciate that. And if you're a veteran, or if you're at, if you're uh, currently serving, and you're prepping for your transition experience, I would argue one of the most powerful things Vince has shared here today, and he shared a page full of notes, at least on my end, is take action. No one's gonna no one's gonna find you a job for you, despite what they may tell you, you've got to get out there, grab that football and run. And that's what you're hearing from Vince here today. So I appreciate you sharing that, Vince. Thank you so much. All right. So we're about to, to learn more about you, what you do now, especially your entrepreneurialism, which I admire. Uh, but before we leave this topic of transition, is there anything else that we have not gotten to that you really feel compelled to share that's going to help others in their transition? Yes. Okay. This is another big one. We, especially military guys, because you're used to getting up and checking out your plan of the day, your POD. And the plan of the day lists from 07 to, let's say, 1645. And if you're underway, then it's from 07 to midnight, right? Right. Here's the biggest one. And I've done this before, and this works. Do not have a job interview on Monday and decide that all of a sudden you are uh, – don't, don't get too grandiose. If you have an interview at three o'clock on Monday, that does not mean wake up at 6 a.m., go on a six mile jog, get home, call everybody that you need to, don't. Do, do one thing at a time. You're no longer in the military. If you're an aggressive student, get out and out of college and you're used to that. When it comes business time and you're doing the interview process and you're doing the research, nothing else matters. Uh, should you get a jog in and take care of yourself physically and have a good diet? Of, co of course, that, that goes without saying, right? But don't overwhelm yourself. Th this is what people do. And I, I've heard it a hundred times and I've done it myself where you'll have a 2.15 p.m. call and then you're 
best friend or your mom or someone's going to call you. I promise you this will happen to you. And you're going to answer that phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I can talk. And you're going to something's going to happen. And you're going to be late to that interview. You know what I'm talking about, Scott? I sure do. It happens all the time. You, you got to have a, a sense of discipline, yeah. right? And not overcommit. That's right. I, I love that. That You know, a lot of folks don't share that. And it's really important because just because someone's calling you, don't take that call. That don't prep time right before that interview, that prep time right before that big conversation, that is some of your most valuable time. And, and you've got to really block it out and focus, right? Yeah. If you can't focus on that one effort for that one person, you're not going to be able to do it in other areas of your life. I mean, I, this is a poor example, but this is a fact since I'm sharing the facts that I know is I literally sat one day and I watched Netflix because I had like a 415 appointment and I knew I'd been preparing for this appointment pretty much my entire life. And I thought there is nothing that can screw this up. I turned my phone off. I would check it every few hours to see if the gentleman that I was going to contact uh, could reach out to me. But I literally sat and I watched uh, documentaries on Netflix. I, only watch things that I knew that would soothe me, you know, which sounds however it sounds. But I did what I knew I had to do to relax me and prepare that only me and this occasion matter. Because Netflix is, you know, watching TV is a bunch of BS. You shouldn't do it. But I knew that if I was to go into the office, hell, there was going to be someone that was going to take my time. So I locked my front door, sat in my office, turned my phone off, and I watched Netflix till about 2. Then I got up, took a shower, put my suit on, and there was nobody or no one that could interfere with my time. So allow yourself to have that one thing to do and don't feel like you have to spread yourself thin because that's that's false. I love that. And um, some of what I heard there and you, you were talking earlier along the lines of surrounding yourself with positivity and, 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 and really being positive. I think right. really controlling your psyche and controlling what – impacts your psyche especially what with what's within your control is such a powerful concept and that's kind of what you're speaking to there and if it's hey if it's watching a certain show on netflix or if it's you know walking out and getting some sunshine with your dog or right. if it's if it's if it's talking with your mom that morning you know i, I certainly draw some a lot of positivity from from that but we all we all of course are impacted with differently by different activities so the famous adam sandler movie happy gilmore was that what it is about find your happy place. That's right. <laughs> it, that, as silly as it sounds, that is sound advice. It really is. All right, so Vince, appreciate really what you're sharing, whether it's related to transition or whether it's related to productivity or positivity. There's a lot of universal truths in what you're sharing. So let's, let's shift gears a smidge and let's talk more about what you do and how you're helping organizations. And then we're going to get a couple observations on the talent market, which is a really, you know, top of mind for so many people. Terrific. Thanks, Scott. Okay. So what I do is I have two companies. One, like I mentioned, is the uh, kind of a catch-all for recruiting. And then number the second company, Scale Executive Search, is focused on executive or pre-executive. So senior managers, directors to the C-suite. And I've, uh, I operate out of Redondo and I've filled positions in Mexico, China, and then throughout the U.S. Is there... Any particular sectors you focus in on? Yeah, you know, I'm still working on that, Scott. And that, and when, when you say that, it's kind of that elevator pitch thing. And this is what happened a couple of days ago. So let's use this as a good case in point. Is uh, I, I do the best with the people that I admire. So when I'm talking to a CEO or a hiring manager, and a hiring manager could be a CEO. A hiring manager is anyone that's in charge of the hiring process. I usually talk to VPs of HR. COOs and CEOs. And that's because I work with smaller companies. Because if you're a big, like Apple, you're not going to hire me to find your next COO mm. or even your director of engineering. I'm, I've had a lot of success in the healthcare, uh, the fasteners, so airplane fasteners. I got to work with a gentleman named Scott Tucker who had his MBA at um, Harvard, extremely bright guy. And the way that I got him was I went into his office because he was next door down the road from my office when I was in Marina Del Rey. One thing I like to do is take offices everywhere I go or everywhere that I'm interested in. So downtown LA, Marina Del Rey, which is also called Silicon Beach right now because everybody's flocking there for the whole <laughs> tech or tech by the beach. So anyway, I just kept on walking into his office and he, he wouldn't meet with me. And then I finally left him a voicemail and then he finally called me back. So again, tenacity, right? And he said, okay, well, what, what do you want to do for me, man? And I said, Scott, I need, to I need to find your people. So I found his COO. I found his VP of sales. 
Um, I found his VP of HR. I mean, just his his C-suite are people that I found. And you have, I mean, it's the best thing in the world to work wow. with someone that you admire and then find them their people. So I've had success in a multitude of arenas or industries. But the number one thing that, that really draws me in is, you know, do I admire you and what is your company about? So Scott sells fasteners, which are it's like the least unsexy thing. And those are my words. Those are what faster people say. It's the least unsexy thing you can sell or uh, do business with in the world. But when you do business with people that appreciate the flow of business and the inner communications and the networking of business, then it's, it's just a, it's a win-win all around. So I like, I like hearing that approach about kind of finding that cultural fit in terms of your clientele, because we all know if, if that's missing, that can lead to a, a whole host of problems, right? And, and not that you have to see the world the same as, as, as anyone else, because, you know, there's a, there's a beautiful component of diversity that, that we all appreciate so much. But just you, you work similar, you have similar values. I, I like how you uh, identify the businesses and those cultures that appeal to you that you can connect with that make a lot of sense. In, in who you do business with. There, there's a lot of um, good stuff there, Vince. Let's go broader. Now that we have a, a good sense of what you do and the types of, of companies that, that you work with, let's get, get a couple of observations. When you, when you look at this talent market here and as we move into, hard to believe, but September 2020, what's a couple of observations that, that you've made here with the talent market? I'm telling a story. And that, that's the only reason why I'm able to lure in these outstanding candidates is that I tell a good story. So what I'm getting at is as a candidate, as a CEO, if you're a C, because the talent right now is just flooded for certain positions, especially at the executive level. And what's happening is it's no longer uh, necessarily about the, the type of degree and let's say the years of experience. It's important. But right now what's dominating is what is your story? Mm. You know, have you been fired before? Why were you fired? You know, were you drinking? I mean, the, the stuff that I hear is insane from drinking on the job to, to getting caught looking at stuff on the computer. And I'm talking about high level C-suite people are getting caught with this garbage. So what the answer right now in this tumultuous time is what is your story and where are you headed? Because when you sit with the CEO or the hiring manager who has already talked to at least 20 people that week, or maybe even the last couple of days, they've already heard all this stuff. They already know what you can do. They, they know the milestones. They know you did this and you became this. And you, but what, what is your real connection and your story? Now, is your connection going to match with everyone, should you do a little homework on whoever's interviewing you and go on LinkedIn and type in their name and figure out if you have someone or something, whether it's golf or alumni or friends of alumni in common, of right. course you should. But if you don't, which is completely fine, be genuine and know your story. And what I mean by your story is, you know, how did you evolve through as an employee and as a, if you're a father or a mother, you know, cause being a mom or a dad and running your own company or uh, showing up for work five days a week and waking up at 6 a.m., getting your kids to school and showing up on time at work is damn near impossible, but people do it every day. And I'm so proud of them. I love to call them friends and candidates and, and clients. So know your story right now is the answer because the job market's flooded. I love that. Uh, and, and everyone, Everyone of all ages loves a good story. And, right. you know, that is it's so easy to connect with people when you've got a well thought out, intuitive, sometimes humorous story. So that's, uh, that's great advice. Storytelling is, is what's old is new again. Storytelling is so much value there these days in the marketplace. And it's how you can really stand out. Um, all right. So I want to make sure, Vince, uh, I hate to kind of wind things down because there, there's so much there that you've shared. And I bet there's I bet there's a lot more chapters there. But let's make sure our listeners know how to connect with you and learn more about your organization. So what's the best way for folks to reach out and connect with you? Thanks so much, Scott. So the website is Scale Executive Search. And then my email is Vince, V-I-N-C-E, at Scale Execs. So E-X-E-C-S. So Vince at scalexx.com. It's just and that easy. Can, yeah, it's just that easy. You know, email me uh, with any with any question that you have, or even if it's just to say hello and then learn about a different market segment or whatever it is, because what I do all day, and th 
here's the number one thing that happens with people and recruiters is that everyone's concerned about where the money's made and if they have to pay. No one pays me a dime that I that I chat with. And the clients pay me the money. So when it comes time to now, if you're gonna if you need somebody to review your resume, go to a professional resume site. Right. Whenever I get a candidate, if their resume doesn't look good, that's completely fine. I'm not a pro in resumes. I don't ever want to be. I'm not a nitpicker, like as you can tell, I'm a storyteller. That's so right. if your resume looks like crap, that's that's on you. If you you are on paper, who you are in person, you need to realize that. So if you're going to spend 20 bucks for somebody on Fiverr to review your resume, fantastic. But call me with those or email me for those specific questions that uh, where I can help you with that, uh, that one or 2% that you need. Like, how am I going to find that hiring manager, Vince? Man, we will jump on a call and I will show you who that person is. I will sit on the phone while you talk to them. We'll write down notes. We'll, we'll, we can make it all happen. Love it. And there's a lot of truth there. Uh, it, some of the best money I've spent in my career was on a great resume writer, right? You get what you pay for. And yeah, it's worth it. It, really. it really is. It's an investment in yourself. So that, uh, very well put there, Vince. Well, Vince, I really enjoyed it. I'm so glad that we got connected. You've got so much to share. I, I love your story and, and variety of the stories you've told here today. And I uh, really appreciate your time. So we've been talking with Vince Wainwright, founder at Scale Executive Search. And we'll make it easy. We'll make it really easy, for folks, to connect with you by putting some of the the, uh, the sites and your, your LinkedIn and whatnot on the show notes, Vince. Thanks. Hey, Scott, too. I, I, we were remiss if I didn't, one, say, you know, always a pleasure to meet another veteran. Thanks for being such an outstanding guy. And then, two, for allowing to, to create this platform, because I know this is an offshoot. I know you have that extremely successful podcast that my sister's raved about. So the fact that you took the time to chat with me, man, you've made my entire week. I'm extremely grateful. So if there's ever anything I can do for you, I'm always a call away, okay? Vince, thanks so much. A lot of kindred spirits there. So to our listeners, hopefully you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. I've, I've got about eight pages of notes from, from the things that Vince has shared. But on behalf of our entire team here at Veteran Voices, hey, we invite you to find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And if you're a veteran listening to this and you've got a story that you'd like to share, hey, reach out. We'll try to fit you into our, our programming schedule. We'd love to, you know, we're here to hear your stories and to hear your experiences. So reach out and let us know. On behalf of our team, hey, this is Scott Luton signing off. Do good, give forward. Be the change that's needed. And with that, we'll see you next time here on Veteran Voices. Thanks, everybody.